Hello and welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning, lecture number 14. We've already spent quite some time in this lecture course developing a quite powerful probabilistic extensive framework for one very specific type of machine learning problem, which is supervised regression. So that's supervised machine learning in which the quantity we're trying to learn is a function that maps from the input domain to the real line. In the last lecture, number 13, for the first time we encountered a variation of this setting called classification in which the observations we make are not real valued but instead they are categorical. So we observe individual classes, either two classes in the binary classification setting or multiple classes, multiple categories at different input locations. Now studying this problem a little bit in the last lecture we discovered that actually we can address this supervised classification problem more or less with a minor variation of the powerful framework for regression that we've constructed in previous lectures. That's of course nice because it allows us to salvage a lot of the analysis that we did and a lot of the understanding we constructed in the previous lectures. In particular we understood that we can treat classification as what's called a discriminative machine learning problem or formulation in which we believe that we observe let's say these binary labels that are either plus or minus one with a probability that can be described as arising from the nonlinear transformation of a latent real valued function which gives us our connection to our regression setting through some nonlinearity that is typically chosen to be a so-called sigmoid for the binary setting. So a S-shaped function, a cumulative density function of some probability measure. And uh, in particular, for the, in the previous lecture, we chose as the sigmoid the logistic function, which you can see here again. If we do so, then the beautiful trick is that we're still talking about a latent real value function and therefore can use a Gaussian process prior with all of the powerful machinery encoded in mean and covariance functions kernels that we've gotten used to over the previous lectures. Now the only problem that arose from this was that um, in doing so we're giving up the nice al analytic algebraic property of Gaussian process regression which is that the likelihood is also Gaussian and the product of a Gaussian and a Gaussian is another Gaussian. So in this kind of classification setting which is called logistic regression or Gaussian process classification we have to come up with a computational approximation to construct an approximate posterior distribution because the true posterior is not analytically tractable in any but the most trivial cases. In the last lecture we spoke at length how to, about how to construct this kind of approximation and in particular we encountered one particularly lightweight, maybe also not particularly powerful but relatively easy to implement kind of approximation that constructs such an approximate posterior called a plus approximation and it consisted of finding the mode of the posterior and then using the geometry of the log posterior as encoded in the curvature matrix, the Hessian, to construct an approximate Gaussian distribution. By taking, uh, by taking the mode as the mean of this Gaussian distribution and the negative inverse Hessian as its covariance matrix. Now in today's lecture I want to dwell a little bit more on these kind of models and in particular sort of study them a bit more to make connections to other frameworks you might have heard about and be interested in and also to think about what kind of power this in particular this Laplace approximation actually holds and whether we can extend it to domains and to model classes that go beyond classification and beyond Gaussian process regression in the latent space. So in particular today we're going to do two things. First, you may have heard, if nowhere else, then for sure in Ulrike von Luxburg's parallel statistical machine learning class about a very beautiful type of machine learning algorithm called the support vector machine, which has great 
relevance, not just historical relevance, but actually continues to have great practical relevance for many applications. And you might have wondered, having seen my lecture on logistic regression, how it is connected to Gaussian process classification. We'll do that first. Then we will take a step forward and think about what other kind of data sets we can apply this algorithm to. So in particular, we'll think about other data that aren't draws from discrete or even binary classes. And then finally, I would like to think about the model side and extend beyond the latent Gaussian process to latent deep neural networks and talk a little bit about the notion of Bayesian deep learning. But let's start though with the support vector machine. Now, you can get a proper formal introduction to support vector machines in other lecture courses, in particular in the parallel lecture course by Professor von Luxburg. So I'm not going to do a derivation of the support vector machine. Instead, I'm going to directly give you the view from the probabilistic side. And then if you already have an education or are getting one about support vector machines from the statistical perspective, then you can make the connection yourself. So here is how you would arrive at the support vector machine coming from where we are coming from, Gaussian process classification, probabilistic logistic regression. So let's start with our probabilistic regression model again. We are assuming we have a Gaussian process prior and we are using a likelihood function that uses this link function that is called the logistic function, which is a specific form of sigmoid. Now, I'm going to have to remind you of a few things that we did in previous lectures, so let's go through these one by one. First of all, notice again that the derivative of this link function with respect to its input can be written as the function times 1 minus that function. That's just an algebraic property of this function. Now, what we did in last week's lecture was to use a Laplace approximation. So to do that, we found the mode of the posterior distribution associated with the Gaussian process prior and this likelihood function. So to find that mode, we took the logarithm of the posterior, that is a sum of the log prior and the log likelihood, plus a constant that doesn't matter for optimization, and then computed the gradient of that log likelihood function. And then tried to find a point where that gradient is zero. So here we go. Here's the gradient of this log posterior. It's given by the gradient of the log likelihood, and that is actually a sum over gradients of individual log likelihoods because we made the assumption that the data are IID when conditioned on the latent function. And here is the gradient of the log prior. So um, the prior is a Gaussian process, so the log prior is a quadratic form minus a quadratic form. And if you take the gradient of that with respect to fx, then you're just left with a linear form. Now, if you set this to zero, then obviously this term is equal to this term, right? You can just easily rearrange. Um, and um, therefore, we can write this expression, which involves this matrix inverse, as the gradient of the log likelihood. This isn't actually particularly helpful um, during optimization because you have to compute this stuff anyway, right? So you have to, you have to compute both terms to get to the, to, the, to the minimum. But it's convenient after you've finished with optimization because it means you can encode this vector directly as this vector, which we might call R, which is the gradient of the log likelihood. Now, um, why is this helpful? Well, it's going to be interesting because this quantity actually shows up in our predictive process. So once we've computed our estimated posterior, approximate posterior on the training points, we can use it to predict classes at other input points, at test points, by, by using the mechanical properties of Gaussian process regression to construct a marginal approximate posterior over the latent function at all of the training points. And that involves computing in particular also a mean function which is um, given by this object, um, which we talked about in the last lecture. So that's just the posterior mean of the latent Gaussian process if the true function is given by this constructed approximate mean 
of the uh, possible distribution at the trading points. Now notice that this expression involves this bit that we compute um, during optimization and which we now know that at the minimum is given by R. So we can think about this expression, this, this predictive distribution, predictive latent quantity, in terms of the kernel multiplied with this gradient of the log likelihood. And that's going to be interesting from an analytic perspective to think about the structure of this predictive. So I'm showing you a one-dimensional picture of this here. So here is a data set that I've specifically constructed to show something, showcase something. On the left-hand side, you get observation training data points, which are all from the negative class, which I've plotted at just the, the bottom end of the plot here. They're not, obviously not at minus four. They're just observations of the negative class. These are these solid points. And then on the right-hand side of zero, let's say that we've only observed positive classes. So what you can think of is there's basically a decision boundary we here at zero, and on the right, there's only class one, and on the left, there's only class minus one. So let's think about what the situation is after we have found our Laplace approximation. So after we found our mode of the posterior. It happens to be that under a Gaussian kernel with a meaningful length scale, this red line here is actually what the posterior is about uh, the, uh, well, not the posterior, that which is the mode of the posterior. So of course, we're only computing the value of that mode at the training point. So that's given by these circles here. These black circles correspond to these values of f hat. And those induce this quantity, this um, approximate posterior mean, which is this red curve here. Now, what we might think about is how that red curve can be represented in terms of the data, in terms of these latent quantities that are these black circles. And that relationship is encoded exactly in this expression. So here, m is just zero, so we're left with this expression. So let's think about this expression a little bit because we just saw from this argument that it's related to the gradient of the log likelihood. So the likelihood is this function that maps from 0 to 1, or that has a range from, from 0 to 1. I've actually plotted the likelihood into this, into this uh, figure. Here we go. So in blue, you see the likelihood for this function, for um, given that we have positive class. So that's the likelihood for this class here. Now, we don't need the gradient of this likelihood. We need the gradient of the logarithm of that likelihood. So that's a function that comes from below and goes up to 1. Now, the logarithm at 1 is 0, right? So you can imagine that as this function gets closer to 0, it has to become in the log space flatter and flatter and flatter as it gets ever closer to, zero, to, to 1 and therefore ever closer to 0 in log space. Now, that means that the gradient of this function of the logarithm of the likelihood becomes flatter and flatter as we get uh, into these regions where f has a high value. And those are exactly the regions over here because our kernel smooths this prediction and therefore creates this um, interpolant between the latent, quanti latent quantities that kind of implicitly assumes that the latent function values within the class are high up here in regions where f has a large value. So in those regions, all of these points will have an associated log likelihood with small gradient over here. And that means that these terms do contribute as a relatively small entry in this vector r. And you can actually see this in the rest of this plot because what I'm showing you as these lots of wiggly lines here are actually these individual kernels between x and um, the training data points multiplied with the values of these gradients. And you can see these, these are each kernels, of course, because these are, this is a weighted sum of kernels. And there's only two entries here that really stand out. And those are the one and two training data points that are close to the decision boundary. Why? Because the latent function has to have a relatively small absolute value in this region. And in that region, the gradient of the log likelihood is actually high. So what you can imagine is that sort of that's an intuitive observation. If you don't know anything about support vector machines, is that if you wanted to compute this latent 
function, the entire latent function actually, this red curve, then you would do quite well to just approximate it with these two points and to almost ignore all the other ones because they contribute a relatively small contribution to this, to this value. Now, of course, that's not quite true because these functions do have a non-trivial gradient over here. So what would we have to do to make this approximation hard or to actually make it exact? Well, we have to, we'd have to make sure that the gradient of the log likelihood in all of in, in within the class, so in regions where this function value is large, and in particular is larger than one, let's say, is actually zero. So that is the idea behind the support vector machine, which is an algorithm that gives rise to a point estimate like this red curve here that algebraically depends exclusively on the training points that are closest to the decision boundary and these are called support points. The corresponding values in the weighted sum are called support vectors. So to get to that, we need a um, loss function, a log loss function that is flat in the region larger than one, and this is called the hinge loss. So let's talk about this again from the loss perspective. I already made this point several times now in previous lectures that you can think of this operation we're doing when we are finding the maximum of the posterior by taking the minimum of the negative log posterior as equivalently solving an empirical risk minimization problem where you can think of the log prior as a, as a regularizer to the risk functional and the log likelihood as the empirical risk. Now, so far for Gaussian process classification, we've decided to use the logistic link function. So that's our log likelihood. And you can think of this as an individual log loss term. So what we just observed was this observation that the computation would be so much easier if the, um, this function here had the property that to the right side of one, it's just flat, it has no gradient. Because if that were the case, then this big sum in our optimization problem, when we compute the gradient of this, actually would only have, hopefully, a very small number or a potentially significantly smaller number of points that are actually non-zero. And these are called the support vectors or the support points. And then we can, of course, think about how to much more efficiently optimize this kind of function by keeping track of only these active terms. And this would be particularly helpful in settings where we have a very large data set that lies dense in the sort of space that we're trying to do our inference over. So to do so, we need a loss function that has this form in the log space and, sorry, well, in that space of what we think of as log likelihoods. And this is actually called the hinge loss. So if you go to a statistical machine learning class, you will arrive at this algorithm from the other direction, so to say. You do empirical risk minimization. You notice that there is this beautiful idea of the hinge loss, which gives rise to this good computational structure, which allows us to do this optimization or solve this optimization problem in a very efficient way. And then you just call that the support vector machine and think about how to design it and use it. And we've just seen that we are sort of tempted to think of this algorithm as arising as a, as a limit case of logistic regression where we take, we adapt our, our loss function such that it has this property that it's flat um, to the right side of the decision boundary. Now, I'm also plotting here in red the actual log of the logistic link function. So you can see that what I just said before kind of makes sense. So the gradient over here becomes ever smaller, but it doesn't actually become zero. Now, the gradient here, by the way, is large on this side, but notice that we don't actually ever need this side to learn because if we are on the, like, at least at the end of optimization, this is the region like, to the left of zero where we have uh, training values in the other class, and that means we have to flip the sign of this loss function, and then we are in this region again. So this is going to be another case of an interesting connection between statistical machine learning and probabilistic machine learning. The support vector machine is quite fundamentally a statistical machine learning algorithm. What we can do from the uh, probabilistic perspective is to think about it in this sense of an um, empirical risk minimization problem that might be associated with a log posterior. If you do that and if you look really closely, then you will discover that actually this connection, unfortunately, 
doesn't quite work and we'll do that now. Why does it not work? Well, to give you the, the answer right away, it's because this particular loss function isn't actually a log, a log likelihood function. And what I mean by that is um, maybe shown best by this picture. So what you see here in this picture is another way to plot the, um, these, these functions, the, both the, the logistic link function and the hinge loss. And here what I'm now doing is I'm taking and plotting the exponential of these functions. So if you're starting to think about an empirical risk and then wonder whether that empirical risk corresponds to a log posterior, then you have to take the exponential, right? You sort of have to take the step in the other direction. Instead of starting from a posterior and taking its logarithm to arrive at an optimization problem, you take an optimization problem and then take the exponential of it to see whether you get a posterior. And what you then notice is in red here, this is the exponential of the logarithm of the logistic function. So it's just the logistic function, of course. And here in dashed red, you get the probability for the other class, which is the sigma of minus f. Now, as you know, the sigma has this property that sigma of minus f is just one minus sigma of f. So therefore, the sum of this dashed line and the solid red line is this that dotted red line up here, which is just the unit function. And that's good because it means that no matter what the latent quantity is, no matter what f is, the probabilities for these two hypotheses, which are which we want to interpret as p of y given f and p of minus y given f, sum to one. And that makes is wonderful because it means that this is actually a probability distribution over the classes. So remember again that likelihoods are not probability distributions over their second argument, over the latent quantity, but they have to be probability distributions by definition about the observed quantity, about the data. So for this red line, this is true. At arbitrary input lo locations, no matter what the latent quantity is, the probabilities for the two classes we consider always sum to one. This is not true for the hinge loss. If you take the hinge loss and take its exponential, then you get this black line here. You can see that it goes all the way up to one and then it becomes flat. And if you take the hinge loss of um, the uh, negative function, then you and take the exponential of that. There's a minus here that's wrong. You take that minus out, but that plus is correct. Then you get this dotted black line here. And if you sum those two, you get this, um, actually this dashed line. If you sum these two, then you get this dotted black line. And you can see that this doesn't sum to one. Now, of course, we could scale this, um, this uh, loss function because remember that we're doing optimization here. So if we scale everything by a constant, then this doesn't change anything about this optimization problem. So in particular, we could scale it such that there is a, that it that is always less or equal than one. So that's not the problem, right? So if we scale things down, then that corresponds to just rescaling the prior, if you like. Then um, we get a function that is always less or equal than one, but it only sums to exactly one at exactly two points at plus and minus one. And it doesn't sum to one in the other regions. So this means that, well, first of all, formally, it just means that we can't think of the hinge loss as a likelihood function, at least not in this form. Now, various people have thought about how to heal this issue. And there are ways of introducing interpretations for how you could still end up with a probabilistic model for this. So one, one that might already spring to your mind is that maybe there's just a third class that we hadn't, haven't considered yet, which, has to, which we can use to fill up the remaining uncertainty. And that third class is maybe only implicitly defined. That's true, and this is actually one way to do this. It's um, unfortunately maybe also a little bit unintuitive, because if you think about where this model is going to be uncertain, about or where, where this model is going to assign mass to this third class, then it's going to be right between the decision boundary, which is maybe a bit odd that if you have two classes approaching each other and then in between, you just sort of um, have a third class that emerges. Notice that it's not an uncertainty about class one or two, it's a certainty about a third class. And it also, and that's maybe a bigger problem, sh shows up inside of the class. So if you have a very large and flat class, and um, uh, you might, might otherwise be, or you would like to be quite certain that inside of that region, 
that class is the right one, then um, you have to live with the fact that the support vector machine, if you want to interpret it in this way, has to sort of as associate a certain non-trivial probability for the third class at the center of this um, class region. So that's actually all maybe a little bit ad hoc and a bit weird, and maybe it's a more natural, a more natural answer is just to think of the SVM as a model that is fundamentally not probabilistic. It's sort of tempting to want to come up with a probabilistic interpretation for it because it has this nice computational property that it creates these support vectors which lead to a sparse optimization problem. But we just can't and maybe we just shouldn't. If you want to use the support vector machine, you're very much invited to do so. It's a great, powerful algorithm, but just don't think of it as a probabilistic model. That's our first gray slide. So we observed in our, let's call it our logistic probabilistic uh, regression classification algorithm that we, um, we, there's a structure in there that means data points that are far from the, from the decision boundary contribute relatively small terms to the predictive latent function that makes it tempting to use a likelihood or a log loss that has the hinge loss structure, but then we discover that this particular loss function is not associated with a likelihood when we take x exponential. And therefore, we should maybe just not think of support vector machines as probabilistic models. They are fundamentally statistical learning machines and are best analyzed from the statistical perspective. That's of course fine, and maybe that's an argument for the statistical machine learning framework, and it is. It also means that this is a kind of learning machine to which it is fundamentally hard, or maybe in some sense impossible, to assign a meaningful notion of uncertainty. It is really just a point estimate, and you should, should treat it as such. With this thought, I'll leave you for a second so that you can take a quick break. Right, so this was our brief discussion of the support vector machine. If you want to know more about it, take a look at the parallel class by Ulrike von Luxburg. What I want to do in the next roughly third of the lecture is to think about what we do if we have data that doesn't come from a binary classification problem. It may have already seemed a little bit arbitrary to you that we've decided to look at binary classification. Obviously, there are many binary classification settings in the world by right? classifying things into good and bad, left and right. Um, the, obviously, this happens a lot, right? Is this or is it not of this class? But of course, there are many other machine learning problems in which the output data is just not real valued, but also not binary valued. One first thing you might naturally, th naturally think about are situations in which you have multiple classes. I've already mentioned this in passing. I actually said that that's also a classification problem, but I haven't really told you how to deal with this if you actually encounter it. So the answer is actually comparably simple. It involves sort of a two step. The first thing is that we're going to actually allow for multiple latent functions. So instead of saying that there is one latent function which goes up and down and when it has a, a high value then it's quite likely to see class one and when it has a low value it's quite likely to see class minus one. Instead we're going to say now that there are let's say capital C classes from one to C that for each of these classes there is a latent function. And that latent function, of course, is defined at all the training points. So in total, if you have n training points and c classes, we now have n times c training observations, where our training observation likelihood somehow should encode that if at a particular location we see a certain class, that all the other classes are like the latent functions representing all the other classes should have a small value and the latent function representing the class that we observe at this point should have a comparably high value. It's possible to encode that in a likelihood using various link functions and one that's particularly popular 
is the so-called softmax link function, which is a generalization of the logistic function, and you see it here. The probability to observe class C at location I is defined to be equal to the exponential of the latent function number i divided by the sum over all such exponentials. This is called softmax because the exponential is, well, has the shape of the exponential and so this function has the property that it sort of takes whichever function has the largest value and attenuates it exponentially more than all the other functions and thereby sort of picks out the maximum if you like. So once we have that link function, and I won't even show you the corresponding slides, you can actually do the corresponding derivation for our Laplace approximation and treat everything as before. The only two major changes you have to make are actually a simple change, which is that whenever you need a gradient of a log likelihood, you just compute the gradient of this object, which is relatively simple to compute. And perhaps to you, the more confusing thing, but what's actually the mathematically easier part, is that you now have to keep track of a latent Gaussian process prior and the associated likelihood and therefore a latent Gaussian process posterior approximated through the Laplace approximation, which keeps track of multiple latent functions. People who haven't spent much time with Gaussian processes yet often struggle with the idea of a so-called multi-output Gaussian process, so one that keeps track of multiple Gaussian process distributed latent functions at the same time, but it's actually really easy. If you find it difficult, then the easiest way to start is to just think of C completely separate Gaussian process priors. So in the logarithm, in the log space, this is just a sum over the individual Gaussian process priors. That's going to be fine, and once you've gotten used to it, you will realize that you can actually also keep track of covariance terms between the latent function values, and that's not so complicated to do. So this framework provides a natural extension of binary classification, logistic regression, to the multivariate case in the sense that we observe multiple classes. Fine, but again, not every data set is of the type that we either get to see a real valued output or a discrete number of classes. Or maybe at this point, though you can already guess what the trick's going to be to extend to some other data sets. It's just going to be a different link function. So we will keep hold of our Gaussian process prior because we know and love it and know how to design it and construct other link functions to produce output spaces that are more amenable to our concrete data set. And the kind of transformations we can consider is in general more or less unbounded, as long as it's a continuous transformation. Of course, we have to be a little bit careful that if we then use a Laplace approximation, we actually still get a meaningful posterior. So to give you a few examples, here are, here's one Gaussian process, a latent Gaussian process, this blue thing here, which I'm transforming in three different ways. This is, if we, if we take its logistic transform, we've already seen that, we get this kind of set of samples. So actually every single frame here is a direct translation of these samples upwards. So I'm really just pushing it through here. And you can see that these samples now between zero, lie between zero and one. So they are good representers for probability distributions and therefore for binary classification tasks in which we get to observe data that comes from class one or class two with probability well, with this probability for class one and with one minus that probability for the other class. Now let's say you make an observation of a quantity that isn't a binary class, but maybe it's some positive, strictly positive number, for example, some rate, some scale, some um, count data in particular, we're going to look at in a moment, then you might be more interested in a model like this, so here I'm taking the exponential of this latent function and the exponential of course makes sure that th these samples are always positive and also that they get this very kind of nonlinear behavior that if this latent function goes towards negative values and they are very close to zero in the range from zero to one, 
and in the region where these, this function goes up, they sort of very ex aggressively extend upwards. Maybe this isn't quite aggressive enough for you yet. You could go even crazier and do a transformation that even involves additionally a polynomial transform and you get an even more crazy model. Why would you choose these kind of models? Well, maybe because you fundamentally believe that that's how the physical process or the real process you're trying to model actually looks like. No matter how you choose your transformation, one thing you could try, assuming the transformation is, is uh, continuous and maybe also monotonic, is that you afterwards try to do approximate inference using a Laplace approximation. Doing so gives rise to at least a point estimate in the latent space that is known as a generalized linear model. Generalized because it generalizes the idea of real-valued regression, which we do with linear models, to observations that are not of the linear type, so they are not real-valued. The word generalized linear model is a little bit dangerous because it is easily confused with other forms of generalization of linear models. So in the, when we first encountered regression, we first talked about learning a linear function, or that might have seemed like a linear model, and then we realized that we actually can learn nonlinear functions in this linear fashion. That might be called a general linear model. So the generalized linear model is something quite different in which we don't get to see just a nonlinear function with Gaussian likelihood. We actually get to see a nonlinear function with non-Gaussian likelihood. To do inference in such models, because the likelihood is not Gaussian, we have to use some form of approximation for the posterior because it's not going to be Gaussian. And the obvious one that suggests itself, given what we've done so far, is of course the Laplace approximation. To remind you once again how it works, here is yet another view, a pictorial view, to approximate this non-Gaussian distribution, the black curve here, which, is, which happens to be the product of a Gaussian prior and a non-Gaussian likelihood, but that doesn't actually matter because we're only going to use the shape of this black curve. We take the logarithm of this curve that looks like this, then take minus the value of this curve um, to find the minimum of this curve. This gives us this black dot here. And then at that point, we're computing the curvature, the second derivative of that current, of that curve to get a quadratic polynomial approximation, a Taylor expansion, and then we revert this entire process. So we take minus the value of this, of this curve again, and then take the exponential of it. And what we get is a Gaussian distribution because that's what Gaussians are, the exponential of minus a quadratic. And that gives us this dashed line. And now because this is Gaussian, we can now use all the nice algebraic properties of Gaussian distributions. And we found this approximation by using a lightweight process that involves only minimizing the function, which you can do with gradients, and then computing the, the second derivative of its logarithm, which is also cheap to do. So that gives us an approximation, which we can then use to do inference in relatively generally structured models. So maybe let me give you one concrete example of how to do that, just for, to keep the motivation a little bit and not just show you that one slide and then rush on. And we are going to use it to actually make a little bit of an adapt adaptation to our Laplace approximation that makes it even more, ag more aggressive and more lightweight. So here is a data set that I uh, just downloaded. This is um, a data set that these days many people look at almost every day. It's the number of coronavirus infections reported to the Robert Koch Institute, that's uh, Germany's national health institution, uh, per day over the course of the pandemic. So I've not actually put the, um, the month here, but only the day since the start of the outbreak. So over here we have um, early February 2020, and this is late May 2020. You can see the new cases coming up. Now imagine that you now want to make a prediction for how this function behaves into the future. Maybe you'd want to do so because you want to, you observe that this function has a clear weekly periodicity. This has something to do with the reporting process and you want to get rid of this periodicity to predict the actual current rate of infections. Or maybe you just want to predict where this thing is going to be a week from now, which at this point is already an interesting question to answer because people seem to be living days ahead to the future rather than months or uh, years. So if you wanted to do this with Gaussian process regression, 
then if you now just put a Gaussian process prior over this model, you hopefully, if you actually try to do so, have an internal alarm bell going off in your head that reminds you that this, this data is really not well modeled by a Gaussian process. Why? Well, so first of all, it has, it, well, first of all, it's just strictly positive, right? So a Gaussian process model fundamentally has to put probability mass onto negative regions or regions of negative real numbers. And we know for a fact there, that there are never negative numbers of new cases. So um, we need a model that only predicts positive numbers. And there's also another problem, which is that even if we ignore this for a little bit and just say, well, you know, this region isn't that interesting anyway, and this is kind of where I want to predict, then this model also has a very extreme kind of dynamic because in this phase of the outbreak, the number of new cases rose, well, how did it, how did it rise? Well, probably actually exponentially because that's the process of an epidemic infection, right? That it initially arises exponentially. So, you will remember that if you go back to the example I did with modeling my body weight that that's also actually a data set in which the observations are fundamentally lower bounded. So in this data set I actually subtracted the initial value so that the values you observe are actually negative sometimes but it's clear that there's a lower physical bound to them because uh, a human being cannot weigh less than zero kilograms and um, maybe actually can't, I, I, someone of my height can't lay weigh, weigh less than a certain minimal weight before it's just not a feasible uh, process anymore. So back then I ignored this problem largely because the, these two problems that are present in this data set were not present. First of all, the dynamic range of the, of the data set was relatively mild. It was a smooth process up and down on a more or less uh, linear or kind of, uh, yeah, n symmetric kind of fashion. So the rises were about as fast as the decays. And um, the dynamic range of the process was realistic. It was sort of uh, somewhere between minus 10 and plus 10. And the uh, lower bound was quite far away, sadly maybe, from the actual um, observed numbers. Now in this data set, we can't make this assumption. And in fact, if you build a Gaussian process model for this, then one thing it might predict over here is a decay that very quickly over here, now that we are in this phase of the pandemic, makes negative predictions, which is really a bad thing to have. So one very simple thing you can do, and this is a standard process if you do build these generalized linear models, is to just take a nonlinear transformation of this data set. And I want to leave it to you for a second to just think about what transformation you might use. Most of you will have chosen, and this is a good idea, to take the logarithm. So here I've done that. I've actually shown you the logarithm of the, of the data set, but I'm actually showing you a little bit more than that already, namely error bars. And I want to talk about these error bars because these are actually important. Now let's imagine you didn't have these error bars. What I, all I've done is I've taken the logarithm of this, of, of this data set. And now, of course, we could do Gaussian process regression on this data set. Now, maybe you actually want to build a model here that has a distinct switch around this point of time because what happened here was a massive public policy in intervention that totally changed the causal structure of this pandemic, which is the lockdown. So from here to there, this data set is probably an exponential rise. So you might want to learn a linear function in log space. That's easy to do. We know how to do that. Um, but one thing you might be worried about if you forget about the error bars is that this data set over here is quite flat. So if you try to learn a linear uh, straight line through this, then all of these uh, observations that are near zero, these are individual cases, have to be included in this linear trend and this will create a bias to make a flatter line basically that doesn't actually fit the data that well. One, well, why is that the case? Well, it's just because fundamentally there is a lower limit here. So we shouldn't learn a linear function because that linear function would then have to extend down here. And this corresponds to fractional cases which are not physical. So what we want is our, for our model to somehow capture the fact that in this region, actually these individual observations are not that particularly informative. And that's of course what these error bars are going to do. So where do these error bars come from? What I've done here is I've used 
a Laplace approximation. Actually, a particularly aggressive one that is even more aggressive than what we've done on, uh, in, in previous models. It's a Laplace approximation on the likelihood rather than on the posterior. This is a minor variation, but I think we can do it now straight ahead to give you an example of how to flexibly play with your toolset or the toolbox to create fast approximate algorithms. So um, what I'm going to assume is that the likelihood, which is our link function, is that we get to observe this count data y that is assumed to be created by some underlying stochastic process that is Gaussian, Gaussian distributed and the data are actually the exponential of that underlying process. So for example, that underlying process might actually be a linear function of time, right? It's sort of a straight line. And let's say that we make observations with Gaussian noise. This isn't quite true, so I've already made a first ass uh, assumption here. And if you want to, you can think about how to criticize this assumption and what other kind of observation model you might want to use here. You're very much invited to think about that. So um, what I want to do is, so on previous slides, in previous parts of, the, of, of this lecture and the one before, we would now have multiplied this with the Gaussian process prior and then try to build a joint Gaussian process posterior approximation to the posterior. What we're going to do instead now is a variant of that, which is even more aggressive, which is that we're going to direct the approximate the likelihood with the Gaussian. Doing so, of course, makes the approximation even wilder, if you like. But also it has the advantage that we can actually compute the approximate term directly, locally, for every single datum, because this likelihood factorizes into individual terms. And build sort of a, if you want, a black box that just takes this count data and directly translates it into a Gaussian likelihood, which we can directly feed to our Gaussian process regressor. And that might work well for a data set like this, which grows quickly to ever larger um, numbers of data. So what we do is, I've actually already written down the answer, but, it's, but um, I'm going to construct it for you by draw, drawing it on the whiteboard. Is to construct a Laplace approximation. So let me rem remind you that we have decided to use a likelihood. Let's do it for every single observation that is given by a Gaussian, an individual one at location fi with, let's say, a constant variance sigma squared. So what is a Laplace approximation? Let me remind you, it's an approximation to second order in the log space. So we take the logarithm of this p of y given fi, and this is up to constants, which don't matter because we are going to find the mode of this expression, minus one half times yi minus fi squared divided by sigma squared. Oh, and this is of course wrong. Our assumption was that this is e to the minus fi, and here we need, e, no, e to the fi, and here we need e to the fi. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's find the mode of this expression. Well, okay, we could compute the gradient, and maybe we should do that, but you can actually read off where the mode of this is, right? Of course, e to the fi has to be equal to yi. But we're going to need second derivatives anyway, so we might as well compute the gradient. So the gradient, the derivative of log pi of yi given fi divided by fi is, so with respect to fi, is the two comes down, the minus stays inside, but there's a minus coming in from here, so we're just left with yi minus e to the fi divided by sigma squared. And if we want this to be zero, then of course fi is going to be the logarithm, the natural logarithm of yi. Okay, so in our Gaussian likelihood for y, in the end we're going to write our, this Gaussian approximation is approximately a Gaussian function of fi around log of yi, and now we just need to know what the variance is going to be. So to get that, we construct the second derivative, 
and that is, well, it's minus e to the fi divided by sigma squared. So if we plug in what fi is at the mode, so if fi is equal to log of yi, then this is just minus yi divided by sigma squared. Now, if you look up again, what the Laplace approximation is, it tells you that we need to take the inverse of this and remove the minus. So multiply with minus one and invert it. So the error is going to be sigma squared divided by yi. The variance, not the error. So now let's go back to our plot. This is exactly what we have here. And this is um, a very intuitive kind of result. What this means is that as we get close to values that are around um, uh, zero, well, or at small values, right, so counts of one, the error bars get very large. And this is good because if you now want to learn a linear model through this, then this model will essentially ignore these observations. And this probabilistic formalism, this probabilistic approximation, will allow you to actually learn a linear function that is informed much more by these later values, which have higher measurement precision than these earlier ones. So this is one, of these, one, one, one advantage of a probabilistic formulation, that um, even though we're making these quite crude approximations, and maybe you want to be careful with your posterior uncertainty to this, even just using them in the likelihood already uh, provides certain kind of um, beneficial aspects that allow these computations to be more robust. Now, maybe over here you want to use a different kind of Gaussian process regression model, one that is maybe also like a linear trend down here, and then maybe a periodic trend on top to get to model the, the reporting behavior of the German authorities. And of course, you could do that too. And again, as the data set returns further down to smaller and smaller values, and let's hope it continues on, that, on this path, then the errors over here will become more important again, which is good because then you can start again to, to focus in your regression model on these earlier parts of the measurement process. With that, um, I would like to conclude this second third of the lecture, which is apart on generalized linear models, if you have a data set that isn't real valued in the, in the observations and isn't also a classification data set, so you don't observe binary labels, then you get to decide which link function to use. And link functions might seem like a small tool set to select from, and of course there are a few obvious choices, like the softmax for discrete classification and the exponential function for um, count data like the one I just showed, but really which one is the right one is up to you because you know where your data comes from and if you don't then maybe go back to whoever collected the data and let them tell you a bit more about where your data came from. If you don't know what the right transformation is, of course, let me remind you, you can assign variables, hyperparameters to your model to your transformation to your uh, link function and learn these using type 2 maximum likelihood. Now in the final part of this lecture I'd like to circle back a little bit to the earlier parts of our discussion of Gaussian models. So before we arrived at Gaussian process models, models which arguably track infinitely many features at one time, we discussed parametric regression. And that idea might seem a little bit quaint at this point, but remember that it's connected to the extremely powerful framework of deep learning, which still very much is at the forefront of machine learning. So back then, when we spoke about parametric regression, I showed you a picture like this and said, if we have inputs and outputs where the outputs are real valued, then what we're doing with parametric regression essentially is to define features and then L um, learn the weights, the linear weights of these features by putting a prior, Gaussian prior over them and then because the likelihood is also Gaussian, the posterior is Gaussian and everything here is tractable. Now if you don't know what your features are and you'd like to learn them, then you can represent the space of features in some kind of parameterized way 
for example, also in a deep way, and then learn those features by maximizing the type 2 maximum likelihood, or sorry, by maximizing the type 2 likelihood, so the marginal likelihood of the uh, observation y under the model that maps from x to y where all the w's are integrated out. Now, it's a bit um, silly maybe to do that if you have a very deep network because, there's a, because then there's a lot of parameters here and the marginalization of those weights up here doesn't make all that much of a difference maybe, but let's not get too much ahead of ourselves and think about the deep aspect later. So having just done generalized linear models, you might now wonder, well, does this view that we here constructed, this connection to deep learning, still hold? And does that mean that we can actually think about learning general linear, uh, general neural networks, so models that map from X to general Y, in particular also classification networks, for example, that we can learn these in a Bayesian fashion? Well, and the answer is yes. So we can maybe start slowly without getting too much ahead of ourselves by going back to where we were in regression and see if the framework we derived back then, so type 2 maximum likelihood to do hierarchical Bayesian inference, whether that still applies. And to do that, we have to basically take the derivations we made for Gaussian process classification and make sure that the two changes from the GP setting to the classification setting work. One of them is that we, actually, well, one is one change to the GP setting, which is that we have parameterized features. Let's see whether that works. And also, um, so far in the classification setting, I haven't actually spoken about how to marginalize the weights, so how to compute evidences. Actually, let's do that first. So let's see whether we can compute the evidence for the observation Y. So that's the marginal over this uh, joint distribution over the labels and all the latent W's where we marginalize out the weights. To do so, I will show you a derivation that comes directly from the great book by Carl Rasmussen and Chris Williams, and it works like this. So what we're interested in is this marginal distribution over Y given X. So that's the, in the integral, the marginal, over the joint distribution over Y and the latent function F and we integrate out f. Now in the regression case, that was easy because this joint distribution is equal to prior times likelihood and the prior and the likelihood were both Gaussian. So therefore, this integral was just an integral over a Gaussian term and we just got a direct analytic answer. Now, the likelihood is not Gaussian anymore, but we have our handy Laplace approximation, which we can use to approximately and in closed form solve this integral. How is that going to work? Well, it's actually just a little bit of a, of a finger exercise. So the, the joint distribution over f and y is the product of prior and likelihood. And so it's the exponential of the logarithm of prior and likelihood. That's a trivial transformation. And now what we've decided to do is to approximate this distribution, which is the product of prior and likelihood with a log quadratic approximation, so with our Laplace approximation. So this term, the logarithm of p of y given f times p of f, likelihood times prior, is what we approximated with a quadratic term. So we approximated it with a term that is a constant, that's the value of, the, of prior and likelihood at the mode, at f hat, and then a quadratic term in f. There's no linear term in the Taylor expansion because we're at the mode, so the gradient is zero. So um, that's our log approximation. So actually there should be a logarithm here. Sorry, that's our log of Q of Y and F given X. Now let's see what if we just pretend that that's the, the, the true distribution happens to our integral here. So we still want to compute this integral, which is going to be approximated by some uh, marginal Q over Y. That's the, um, now let's plug in what we have in the line above. So here's a constant here in front. We take the exponential of a constant minus a quadratic term. So the exponential of a constant doesn't depend on f, only on f hat. So we can move it outside of the integral. It's here. And then there's the integral here over x to negative quadratic form. So that's a Gaussian integral because this is a Gaussian expression, right? It's e to the minus one half times a square. But there's no normalization constant here, so this is not just one because it's not a, a Gaussian probability density function, it's just a Gaussian function, so e to the minus one-half square. We know though what that is, 
it's um, the square root of 2 pi to the power of the dimensionality of this problem. So there are n data points here, so we get an n. And then the determinant of the covariance, so that's k inverse plus w inverse, where w is this matrix of second derivatives of the log likelihood that I've introduced in the previous lecture. So that's just going to be a constant, but it's a constant that we have to keep track of because it involves k and w. So if we are going to tune the model, which in particular also involves k and w, then we have to take that number with us because it's going to affect when uh, the, the overall terms when we tune stuff. This thing here in front is e to the logarithm of the likelihood times the prior. Well, what's the prior? Well, that's just a Gaussian, right? That's our Gaussian process prior. So we can take that outside, right? Uh, so the, um, this here is the logarithm of this two is the sum of these two exponential of a sum is a part of, of exponentials. So we have to x the exponential of the log likelihood times the prior, this is just a Gaussian process, evaluated at this constant, at the mode of the, um, of the posterior distribution. And so this term here in front is easy. That's just x of log. So it's just um, the, well, it's just the likelihood, right? So its logarithm is going to be the uh, log likelihood. This term here, well, actually, I mean, actually, this is the entire, uh, our entire approximate margin. So we could stop at this point and we have what we need. We have q of y given x. Now, of course, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to use this term in the exact same way that we used it in Gaussian process regression or in parametric regression. We want to optimize the terms, the feature functions that enter into all of these expressions as a function of their own parameters. So we're going to compute gradients of this object. And in particular, it's actually more convenient for numerical reasons to compute gradients of its logarithm. So let's take its logarithm. For that, we just take the logarithm of this entire expression. So we're just going to get the log likelihood, this exponential goes, and we're left with the logarithm of a Gaussian. So that's a quadratic term minus a log normalizer. Um, so this is the quadratic term, it's just written down. And here is the log normalizer already subsumed into the term afterwards, because we're also going to get the logarithm of this expression and also plus the logarithm of n half times the logarithm of 2 pi, but that's a constant, so we might as well leave it out. And we're just left with minus 1 half times the logarithm of the determinant of this covariance matrix. This comes from the normalization constant of this Gaussian plus the logarithm of this expression. And we can take those together because the, um, the product of the Determinants is equal to the determinant of the product and we get this expression here. So that's the function we need to optimize and it looks a lot like what you might expect, right? It's a log likelihood, which we know what it is, it's assu assuming we're using, we're using a logistic function, minus a quadratic term, that's our log prior, and then there is another new form of Occam factor. So that's the classification equivalent of the term we had in the Gaussian case. So um, yeah, and it looks like this, which is obviously quite comparable to the corresponding expression that we had in the Gaussian form, where we, well, in the regression case, where we just had here the log determinant of the kernel gram matrix plus the noise um, covariance matrix. Here the noise covariance matrix is replaced by the second derivative of the log likelihood. So that means we can update the algorithm for GP classification or logistic regression training that I introduced in the previous lecture with an additional term in red down here that allows us to also compute the evidence at training time and then, of course, we can use that evidence in an outer loop to train the model. This is an algorithm that is more or less directly taken, again, from Carl Rasmussen's and Chris Williams' book. The um, main thing to observe here is that to compute these quantities, this evidence, we can actually reuse quantities that are already computed inside of this loop. There is an inner product here, so that's a term of linear cost in the number of training data points. Then we need the log likelihood, so that's also something we've already computed. 
and because we know what these values are, also they are cheap to compute because they are local likelihoods, so this is O of n as well. And then we need this Occam factor, which actually can be efficiently computed if you already have a Cholesky decomposition of this matrix, of this matrix B, which is 1 plus this weird expression with square roots of this diagonal matrix W, then the log determinant of this, um, the log determinant of a matrix for which you have a Cholesky decomposition is easy to compute because it uh, can be computed by summing over the diagonal entries in the Cholesky matrix. Actually, that uh, gives you the log square root determinant, which is exactly what we need. So doing so gives us the first part or sort of answer to our two questions. So I said we need to be able to compute evidences because then we can marginalize out and uh, train models. Again, I should probably say that in practice, when people train deep neural networks, they don't do this whether they're Bayesian or not, because if you have a deep neural network, then this final layer is a small part of the entire network. So you might feel like, um, this, uh, like this process, at least during training, is not that important because you're only marginalizing out a relatively small and maybe arbitrary part of your network just because you can and the entire layers under, underneath are approximated with a point estimate. That's true and we'll have to deal with it at, uh, in a few moments actually. So the second thing, of course, we need to be able to do, and that's going to be very easy to verify, is that we're still able to train or to use this classification framework, this Gaussian approximate logistic regression classification framework, if the model is not a Gaussian process, but has features and we want to optimize those features maybe. So you can probably guess that that's of course true, but let's just confirm. So if we use this, what we've now constructed, this Gaussian process classification framework, and we assume that the function we're trying to optimize actually has a parametric form, so that f can be written as, wherever an f shows up here, it can be written as a phi transpose times some weights, let's call them v, then of course everything carries through. So what I have here is the derivation for values of the log posterior and their gradients and their second derivatives that we've seen in the previous lecture where f just had general values um, which we learned at all of the training points f of x. So if f instead has this parametric form then we can basically replace all the values of f in here with phi transpose times v and wherever we take derivatives with respect to v the weights we basically just have to do a chain rule application and we get additional terms outside that give us the derivative of f with respect to v which is just phi essentially. Now notice that of course, so first of all you notice that this still gives us a convex or, or convex minimization and therefore concave maximization problem. Why? So back then when we did uh, classification last lecture for uh, Gaussian processes here we had a kernel gram matrix which was positive definite. The only thing that has changed now is that we get a matrix W which is multiplied from the left and the right with features phi and an inner product in here of the uh, diagonal weights, actually it should be a V, with phi from the left and the right hand side. So um, this matrix is clearly still positive definite if the W's or the V's are positive. And this matrix capital W is still positive definite because it's a positive definite diagonal matrix multiplied from the left and the right with the feature functions. So any matrix multiplied from the left and the right with the same vector or the same matrix transpose is still positive definite as you can easily confirm for yourself in a one line proof. So in the end we're going to apply, we would like to apply this framework not just to learn V but also to learn phi. And of course then we would need to take derivative of this expression with, with respect to phi rather than w, which is also fine. We'll just get v's outside on the left and the right. The only problem we might then get is that those v's are not necessarily positive definite anymore. Well, they are not necessarily positive, so that might screw our optimization problem later down the line, especially once we compute recursive derivatives of lower layers with respect to higher layers and that's of course one of the fundamental challenges of deep learning that the optimization problems are not necessarily convex and therefore optimization can be a little bit more complicated. That's not something that arises from the probabilistic treatment though, it just arises from the fact that we're using features for which we cannot guarantee that we're going to still get uh, convex optimization problems. Okay, so with this, even though 
you might not have really grasped it yet, we actually have all of the machinery to do, to connect at least, deep learning in the classification settings or, or actually in more general supervised machine learning problems, not just regression, to the probabilistic framework. And the key ingredient for it was the Laplace approximation. Wherever there is a loss function that, we, that doesn't have quadratic form, we approximate it in a quadratic fashion and treat that as a Gaussian approximation. Of course, doing so introduces an error, an approximate error, but you might wonder whether that's a bad thing because the alternative is to just use deep neural networks as they are and just that means using a point estimate, an empirical risk minimizer, rather than an uncertainty estimate. And from a Laplace approximation, at least you get a notion of uncertainty over the weights of the neural network at so far only the, the penultimate layer, but in a moment we're going to do the entire network. Why might you want to have such a Bayesian approximation to a neural network and is it actually enough to use a Laplace approximation to do so? Well, of course, no approximation is ever perfectly enough, but what I'd like to show you is a quick, simple argument for why probabilistic uncertainty on deep neural networks can be a very beneficial thing, even if it is very approximate. To do so, let's look at a concrete setting that is very close or maybe is sort of a prototypical form of current deep learning for classification. So let's say we have what you might call a feed-forward neural network for classification. So there is some input x and we assume that the labels y are uh, distributed by drawing from the sigmoid, so the uh, logistic or the softmax function over some parameterized function f of w, which is given by some deep neural network. So that's one not particularly elegant way of writing a deep neural network. It's a cascade or a recursion of linear maps with weight w's applied to nonlinear link functions phi. Now, um, just to make that point again, I've mentioned it several times by now, you can, um, they, what people now usually do to optimize or train such a network is to optimize the weights. So that amounts to type two maximum a posteriori. That means minimizing an empirical risk function, which can be thought of as the logarithm of the logistic likelihood of this function f, where, um, uh, yeah, they, well, exactly like this. So that's a function of f and therefore also of w minus maybe if you want and if you think it's necessary an empirical regularizer, sorry, just a regularizer. So that's a, a, a log prior. For example, you could think of this as weight cost. So if you're using a quadratic weight cost on your weights, then that corresponds to a Gaussian prior on the weights. So um, here we have that. Now let's call this entire function a loss. Let's call it J of W. And then what deep learning amounts to is with all sorts of bells and whistles and tricks and automatic differentiation and mini batching and stochastic optimization, minimizing this empirical risk function. Now doing so, even though it's totally standard, can have certain pathologies. And I'd like to point out one that comes from relatively recent work here in Tübingen by my esteemed colleague Matthias Hein. So imagine that we want to apply this, um, uh, this kind of framework to a classification problem like this with binary classification and actually it also works for multi-class classification and the one decision we make is that these feature functions phi, the non-linearities in the network, are ReLU functions, so rectified linear units. We've already seen them several times in previous lectures. So functions that are piecewise linear. They're for zero up until some threshold and then they turn into a linear function that starts at zero. ReLUs are relatively popular in deep learning and they're also quite relatively easy to analyze. So one interesting thing that uh, Matthias Hein recently pointed out is that if you're using such a network for classification, 
then that network becomes arbitrarily confident far away from the data. What I mean by that is that if you're trying to learn a classifier with this VLU deep network, then this network will learn a decision boundary like this black line and then around it become more and more confident about the class as you move away from the data, even if you're moving almost exactly along the decision boundary, very far to the north here. So why is that? Well, the full theorem is here and you can of, of course read the full derivation in the paper, but to just give you an intuition, the reason for this is that um, VLU classifiers are piecewise linear functions. Now there's two observations to make about this. First of all, even though you're building a hierarchical deep network out of them, this still gives you a piecewise linear function because a piecewise linear function of a piecewise linear function is still a piecewise linear function. And the other observation that is not so straightforward to make but um, is actually correct is if you, if you have finitely many features in your deep neural network, no matter how many and how deep the network is, as long as you are tracking finitely many weights, and of course everyone does, then there is a region outside of the data where all of the features, all of these rectified linear units are either on or off and you're on one side of their decision of their own like little kink of their switch and they will not change anymore. So in that domain as you're moving further and further away from the data you're just looking at a linear function. One that doesn't have any further change points anymore. And therefore you now have as an input to the logistic link function a linear function and as we're moving away that linear function either grows or it falls. And um, unless you're totally lucky and it's just zero. But of course it isn't because you've trained this network and it's never going to be zero. So as you move away, that function therefore becomes arbitrarily large because it's a linear function. And if the input to the sigmoid link function is arbitrarily large, either positive or negative, then the output is zero, zero or one. So this network predicts one of the classes, the red or the green one, with perfect confidence. So asymptotically with probability one. That's of course bad, it's not a property you want your deep neural network to have. It, this of course is a simple picture here, but imagine this as a computer vision task where you've trained on some very narrow manifold of labeled images. If you're now moving away, then you're often still in the domain of natural images, but just, a far, just far away in this high dimensional space from the training images. And then this network can be very confident about the label of an image that it totally badly, incorrectly classifies. So how do we fix this? Well, we fix it, as it turns out, by assigning probabilistic uncertainty to this network. And it turns out, and I'd like to show you this briefly, that this, can, this, this particular flaw can be healed even with a very approximate, very lightweight, very simple Bayesian approximation, probabilistic approximation. And here is how this approximation works. We're going to put a Laplace approximation over the posterior over the weights of the neural network and use that to marginalize out over the predictions. Let's see how that works. So um, we would like to make a prediction. So the prediction if you knew what f is would be just to apply the sigmoid to it. But in reality we don't really know what the right weights of our neural network are. So we would like to actually compute properly a marginal distribution over the predictive class. So that's integrating out the uncertainty over the weights. And to do so, we would like to use the true posterior over the weights given y. That posterior, at least if we trust this deep learning model, amounts to the exponential of this, or actually minus this expression down here, up to normalization, right? Because this is the product of a negative log, at the negative, no, the product of a negative prior and likelihood. So, um, we can't do this in practice, of course, because this expression is, is difficult to operate with because it includes this deep structure. So the problem here is not really that there is this uh, sigmoid here all that much. The problem is because we've already solved that with our Laplace approximation, right? The problem is that this f here is a deep function, a recursive application of uh, nonlinearities. So what we can deal with that just as we could with the other nonlinearities using a Laplace approximation. So we replace this posterior over the weights with a Gaussian that um, is a Laplace approximation. So it consists of a Gaussian with a mean that is given by the mode of this function. Notice that we already have that mode because we've trained our deep neural network so we know where the minimum is and a curvature 
that is, um, or actually a covariance matrix that is given by the negative inverse curvature of the, the loss function j of w from two slides ago. And we could call that psi the matrix of covariances. You may wonder about how expensive this is. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, one problem is though that this integral up here is over f, well actually it's integral over w, but w shows up in f in here. So f is a, not a linear function of w anymore. It is in the, pe in the ultimate layer, in the final layer of the neural network, the output layer from the um, deep nonlinearities, the relus to the classification. But below that, it's not a linear function of w because these weights enter into the nonlinearities, into the VLU nonlinearities. So to deal with that, we just approximate our loss function, um, actually our predictive function by a linear function. So we say that f of x is given by f of x evaluated at w star. So that's exactly the prediction we would do in the classic deep learning setting, we just evaluate f at the trained location, plus a linear term that is given by the Jacobian of um, the predictive function with respect to the weights, times the distance between the weights and the, the map estimate w star. So this is a Taylor approximation to first order, and computing this approximation is easy because it involves a, a, a Jacobian of the predictive function with respect to the weights, which is something that we already need to compute anyway to make predictions. It's our standard, part of our standard backdrop pass. So with these two approximations, so with a linear approximations to f, approximation to f, and a log quadratic, therefore Gaussian approximation to the distribution over the weights, we can actually now do this integral in closed form because we now have a Gaussian posterior over W and therefore a Gaussian implied distribution over F because F is a linear function of W now in this approximation, which is a Gaussian with, uh, over F at, with a mean F of W star and a covariance that is given by the approximate Gaussian covariance over the weights, and then apply to that to it from the left and the right the Jacobian of the predictive function. That's just a Gaussian distribution over the prediction, the latent prediction um, in, that enters the sigmoid to predict our class Y. Now the final thing to do is to do this integral, which you can now almost do because we now have a Gaussian distribution over F and we're only integrating against this sigmoid. So that's some, a problem we already encountered in Gaussian process classification. And there are simple approximations to it. In particular, there is a, a classic one that comes from David Mackay, like a lot of the results we're talking about here today. I'll mention that in a moment again, which is that the approximate, this, forget about this ANS, that's a typo. So P of Y given one given X, this thing up here is approximately the sigmoid evaluated at the predictive mean of this Gaussian divided by the square root of one plus pi over eight times the variance. So this looks a little complicated, but it's just the result of a simple linearized integral. So is this problem that Matthias Hein pointed out now still valid? Well, the problem used to be that our m of x, so notice that m of x is equal to f of w star, that that's a linear function. And as we are now moving away from the training points, x becomes very large, and because this is a linear function in x, this function becomes very large, and sigma of that large function goes to either one or zero, depending on whether it's large in a positive or negative sense. Now, in, under this Gaussian approximation, we correct this mean prediction by this term that involves the variance, the square root of the variance, actually. Now, we notice that this variance involves this Jacobian with respect to x. So this is a linear function, and therefore, of course, there is an x in here. So you can think of this roughly as an expression that looks like x times psi times x transpose. So it's quadratic in x, and we take the square root of it, so very roughly speaking, there's a linear function here that gets divided by another linear function, so the square root of a square function. And therefore, you can imagine that this is not necessarily something anymore that, deviate, that, that uh, goes to a large value as x becomes large in absolute terms. That's a bit of a hand wavy argument. It turns out that you can make this argument formal. And this is the result of a paper that's uh, uh, currently actually still a preprint um, written by Agustinus Christiadi, 
who is a PhD student here in Tübingen, um, working in my group and also with Matthias Hein, who showed that this is actually the case. So here's a more formal statement that says, if you are in this setting that was, uh, we just discussed on the previous few slides, and you're moving far away from the training data, then under this VLU architecture of the network and the Laplace approximation, the predictive uncertainty, so the predictive probability for a particular class label goes to a number as you move far away from the data that is bounded away from zero and one. So the network does not become overconfident anymore under this extremely simple, very strongly approximate Gaussian approximation. Results like this provide arguments for why you might want to consider constructing an at least an approximate posterior to your deep neural network. Now this is an asymptotic statement and it's just one specific statement about a specific class of deep neural networks, VLU networks, in, in this particular case even a binary classification setting. But I mean, if, instead of me trying to give you more arguments for why you want to be Bayesian, maybe let me address what's probably more on your mind having gone through this which are two more maybe practically minded questions. The first one is, but okay, isn't that going to be expensive? I've heard Bayesian methods are very expensive. And B, okay, this was all very super complicated and I don't feel like I'm able to actually do this myself. This seems like a very quick tour into deep, into uh, Bayesian deep learning. And now I don't feel empowered to do this at all. So let me tell you two quick answers at the very end of this lecture. The first one is, the ex how expensive this approximation really is depends on how precise you want to make the approximation. So of course if you build the full Hessian of an entire deep neural network that's going to be an expensive operation because it's going to be a matrix of, the, of size square in the number of weights of the network. And then you have to invert that whole thing to get an uncertainty and of course that's going to be very expensive to do. But nobody said that you have to use the entire Hessian. There's lots of different approximations which make this process much more lightweight. And since we're already making strong linear quadratic approximations, we might as well make even those approximations a little bit weaker. For example, you could decide to use a low rank approximation of the Hessian. Those are possible to construct from matrix vector multiplications with the Hessian, which have a cost that is roughly the same as uh, a backprop pass. You could also decide to use only um, a block diagonal approximation of the Hessian. So for example, one block for each layer so that each layer has its own Hessian or even more extreme for the output layer, one block for each class prediction in a multi-class setting. You could also just decide to use only the very last layer. So then we are back in the essentially in the Gaussian classification, Gaussian parametric regression classification sort of domain. Um, actually the plot we showed, I showed you here does use this last layer approximation and you can see that it's not particularly bad actually. Typically what happens if you add the more structure of the Hessian from lower layers is that this uncertainty just gets more structure, gets a little bit more fine grained but this has a relatively minor effect. And the most extreme thing to do is to just use the diagonal of the Hessian. So that amounts to independent uncertainty for every single unit of the, of the network. Doing so of course is very cheap because it's essentially as expensive as computing the, as a single gradient. At least on paper. Now how difficult is it to implement all of these things? Well actually it used to be up until quite recently still quite non-trivial to get these right and required quite a lot of deep thought to get right. But things have changed and uh, um, I mean they are still changing very rapidly. There are lots of new software tools out that help with this kind of process um, on uh, using automated differentiation and I want to highlight one of course shamefully uh, um, uh, indecent by um, uh, plugging a piece of software from my own group that's called Backpack for PyTorch. Um, this is the logo, this is the website. It's Backpack for PyTorch, which was uh, built by Felix Dangel and Frederick Künstner 
in my group. It was just published a few weeks ago, um, uh, this recording is in 2020, at the iClio conference, the International Conference of Learning and Representations. And it can be used, it offers all sorts of syntactic sugar and, and uh, hooks into PyTorch to compute second order variables like these curvature quantities, these diagonal or other factorizations of the Hessian, and also additional quantities like variances of gradients, which we're not going to use here. To give you an idea of how this works, I've actually asked Agostinos Cristiadi, who wrote this paper I just cited, to uh, create, create a little bit of a code example, which I will upload on Ilias so that you can look at it. And it gives you an idea of how easy this code is. It's so easy that I can do this at the very end of this lecture, just in a few seconds. I can show you this is the, this is the thing you're going to find on Ilias. So um, it's a demonstration of this process for multi-class classification. The, I've copied out or um, um, collapsed out a bit of code that produces this data set here. This is a, this is a four class classification problem with four classes. Now, in this piece of code, um, which I'm not going to go through much, is a piece of setup for Torch that creates a neural network that has two VLU layers. So it, it, that's arguably a, a deep neural network, but of course you can make it deeper if you want to with a batch norm layers in between. And now here comes the important bit. So we first make a prediction to see that this problem still exists. So as we are moving far away from the data, this blueness here shows confidence of the model in the individual classes. So you can guess that this model up here predicts the, the magenta class, here the yellow class, the green and the red class with high confidence. And as we move away, it becomes overly confident. And then you can read this if you like later on. What uh, Agostinos now does here is, it is, is he uses the functionality from this backpack library, which provides extensions in particular also for the com computation of factorized versions of the Hessian. And this happens actually in here. So we add the cross entropy loss function, that's the predictive um, uh, likelihood for multi class classification, and then add an extension, that's the one line that does all, actually all the, all the magic from Backpack that computes a chronicle factored approximate curvature, KFACT is the corresponding technical term for these. Um, it's also a relatively recent addition to um, compute exactly this chronicle factorization. So that happens in this line. And then we can invert this, um, these, these quantities to get our Laplace approximation in these lines and then use them to predict. And that uses, let me just go back to the slide, uses this idea of computing a quantity like this. So this um, inner product of the Jacobian with the curvature, this happens in actual code in this line here. You can sort of see that that's, that's what's probably happening. And we can use that now to predict through the softmax. Through the softmax, it's a little bit more complicated to predict. There is no, at least no generally accepted easy approximation for this classification prediction. Actually there is, but there's no time to, to talk about it now. Otherwise I would have to plug yet another paper from my group. And um, instead we just do sampling. So we just draw a bunch of samples from this Gaussian distribution and push them through the softmax. And that gives a prediction like this for these classes. It's a flipped image <laughs> annoyingly, but you can now see that this predictive distribution produces meaningful uncertainty as you move away from the data. And as you move away far away, it always becomes quite uncertain about the correct class label, which is exactly what we want. So with this, I hopefully, I, I hope to have convinced you that being Bayesian about deep learning doesn't have to be a complicated process. It doesn't have to involve writing your own code and it doesn't have to involve additional highly complex computational steps. It does require a little bit of additional computation, but you can make that additional computation very cheap if you are okay with cheap approximations. Maybe you've read somewhere else that Bayesian deep learning doesn't work, that it's a complicated process, that it's very expensive, that it's not nowhere near done. And maybe that's true. There is a lot of research going on in the community to build more powerful, more reliable, more robust and efficient Bayesian approximation schemes for deep learning that are more powerful than this. They also tend to be more expensive and also much, much harder to implement. But that's a question for researchers. If you just want to train your deep neural network, 
and assign meaningful error bars to its predictions, then simple tools like this can be enough to get to this point. Now you might wonder why you don't read about these kind of results in uh, papers. Well, I mean, you can read our papers, but why you don't read about them in other papers? Well, maybe one reason for that is that the Laplace approximation is not a new idea at all. It was maybe introduced for this particular deep learning setting at a time when people weren't talking yet about deep learning in 1992 by uh, David Mackay. Here he is again, the wonderful David Mackay, um, in a paper that actually has all of the ingredients that we just uh, discussed today. It's called the Evidence Framework Applied to Classification Networks. You can maybe just by skimming this abstract already guess that this paper essentially introduces all of the quantities and all of the notions and algorithms I just discussed. And maybe because this idea is now 30 years old, that's actually the reason why people have stopped write writing papers about this. That's maybe a good thing because no one needs an infinite number of papers about an old idea. But that doesn't mean that the old idea doesn't work anymore just because the world has, it, has advanced. As you just see in these examples, it actually still works quite well. And if you are have facing a practical deep learning problem, I would actually recommend that you try as far as possible to use these simple ways of quantifying uncertainty in your um, deep learning architecture. With that, we're at the end of today's lecture. We've tied up quite a few loose strings before we can move on to a totally new topic in the next lecture, which um, made connections to various different other domains from our Gaussian process classification framework that I introduced in the previous lecture. We saw that support vector machines, which are an important class of um, supervised learning machines, are in some sense a corner case of the framework, of the logistic regression framework, which um, uh, has very beneficial computational aspects, but unfortunately is um, fundamentally not a probabilistic model because it involves a, a loss function, a risk function that is not a log likelihood. That's an interesting case to study and it um, highlights the, the points where the connection between the statistical and the probabilistic framework are not so close to each other and then require different kind of, kind of analytic techniques. And in turn, this also means that uncertainty is difficult to construct over SVM models. We then moved on to generalized linear models to point out that if you have data that is fundamentally not real valued, but has other structure and beyond even binary or multi-class classification, then you can use other likelihoods, other non-linearities to build what's called generalized linear models. And it's possible to save to um, transport over much of the functionality of the Gaussian process regression framework using the Laplace approximation for approximate inference. In fact, I could have called the entire lecture the Laplace approximation because I kept using it in the final part as well, in which I pointed out that the Laplace approximation can also be used to build approximate, potentially strongly approximate, posterior distributions for deep neural networks. Even though they are approximate, I showed you some simple asymptotic properties, quite recent results, that maybe support this idea or motivate this idea of using such Gaussian approximations in deep learning, in particular because such approximations are now, with new software tools, also relatively easy to implement. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and I'm looking forward to see you again in the next one.